right. So again, what a twitch is, um, a twitch is a single stimulus, contraction, relaxation. Okay? A single twitch is just not strong enough to cause a contraction to happen. When you see your muscle twitching, it's not the same thing over here. That's a group of little muscles that are actually twitching. I'm talking about one little twitch you are not going to see. This twitching that you might see here or on your eye, that's usually due to um, like sleep deprivation, which is another thing we'll talk about later on. But the thing is, here, a twitch, you can't see. This is what we're talking about with a twitch. The only way you can see this is put you know, by electrodes over here and see the muscle contract and relax relax on a computer screen okay so people who do in like say exercise physiology physical therapy they're going to be learning more about twitches and breaking it all down and you would see it on a myogram and that's what that is but we could learn a lot from a twitch so that's why i wanted to talk to you about a twitch so a twitch is a single stimulus contraction relaxation okay so the phases of it we have a latent or lag phase. This is just after the stimulus, no response is seen, and this is when the action potential sweeps across the sarcolemma, down the T-tubules, and allows the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release the calcium. That's what that is. At this point, you shouldn't see any kind of contraction. All right, it just got released, but it didn't. the calcium did not bind to the troponin. Okay, they get released. Then, contraction phase is when the troponin gets a move, or moves because the calcium binds to it, and you're going to have the cross bridging. Just like I did with our sleeve over there, you got the cross bridging, you're going to have the contraction. Then you have the relaxation phase, and that's when the calcium levels fall. They go back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And when they do, the tropomycin is now going to recover those myosin binding sites and myosin can't bind to active, causes relaxation. So we have these three phases in a twitch, and this is what it looks like. All right. Now, let me just say this, even being recorded here, this is not an action potential. It's a totally different concept. But looking at it fast, you're thinking, well, it's a graph, it's different though. Okay. This is the force of contraction. This is time. This is one twitch. The latent phase is right here. The contraction phase is over here. And then the relaxation phase is where the green is. Okay? That's one twitch. You can't see a twitch happening on your arm. It can only be seen on a computer or a graph of some sort. Okay? A printout. So we have a few different types of twitches. We have wave summation. This is where a second stimulus is applied during the relaxation phase. The second twitch is going to be stronger than the first. Okay. If the stimulus occurs at a faster rate, the relaxation phase becomes shorter and shorter. So let's look at what it looks like. This is a twitch. We go up and it goes straight back down. But while the relaxation phase, if we do another stimulus there, it can happen another, another uh, twitch will occur at a higher one, a much higher force. And it doesn't reach back down to its, you know, the unforced area here. And you can do another stimulus and another one and another one. And it builds and builds and builds. Okay? Again, this is not an action potential. People are thinking, well, if you do another stimulus, isn't that during the absolute uh, refractive period? Yeah, but that's different than what this is. Okay, so I don't want to get too mixed up here. All right? Until the stimulus disappears and then just goes straight back down. All right? So this is wave summation. Summation, because we're adding. The, with the stimulus, we can add it and it gets higher and higher. The force is getting stronger and stronger. That's a sum or a summation. It gets higher. Then we can have tetany. Now, this is not the same tetany as I showed you with Mikey the dog. 
Okay? That's the disease. That's the bacteria that causes this. They like to use the technique for something else. Again, it's on my list. When I go up there, why are you picking the same thing to confuse my students? I'm telling you, don't get confused, but they are used, the terms are used in the same way, but they're two totally different things. We could have two forms of tetanus when we're dealing with twitches. Complete tetanus and incomplete tetanus. Incomplete is the way sublimation almost reaches its tension maximum, but it never makes it there. Complete tetanus is that it reaches its maximum, and this is when calcium cannot re-enter the sarcoplasmic reticulum. You have that full contraction, you can't do anything more with that, it's just like when I was doing her sleep, there's so much more my arm could go under her, her armpit, and that's it. I can't go further than that. So it reaches its maximum. This rarely occurs in normal functioning muscles. We don't usually go all the way like that. And this here in green is just emphasizing, don't get confused with the bacteria that causes tetanus. It has nothing to do with this. So let's see what incomplete and complete looks like. Here's incomplete. So you could have the summation going on like I showed you before, but it never reaches its maximum. Complete tetanus, it goes all the way up there. No matter how much more stimulus we can put on there, it does, it caps off. It can't go higher than that maximum. Okay? So far so good? All right. Then we got drape, which means staircase, okay? And it creates this staircase that we're seeing over here. Stimulation occurs immediately after relaxation phase. So in other words, it reaches right back down to zero, but then as soon as it hits zero, we do another stimulus. We don't have a delay. It happens immediately. Well, if that happens, then the next twitch is much stronger. So the con subsequent contractions get stronger until it reaches its maximum. All right? This is rare, but it occurs in muscle after a prolonged period of time of rest. This is where we actually, you ever go running or you want to run and you try to warm your muscles? This is what happens over here. All right? So we could put heat. It's due to heat by, work, by the working muscle to increase the rate. So if you warm a muscle, then you're gonna be able to produce stronger contractions due to the heat that would cause this trape. All right? And what it looks like is this. It goes up, but as soon as it goes down to the relaxation phase, at the very end of it, we do another stimulus immediately, and the next one's even stronger. This one, even stronger, until it reaches its cap. So it creates this stair case effect. Okay? That's trape. So duration of a twitch, it varies depending on the muscle type, which we're going to talk about different types of muscles. All right? Muscle location, where is it? Is it muscles that move your eyeball? Is it muscles that move your back? Internal, external conditions, heat or not? Okay? And other factors. So here's two different twitches. Here's one for an eye muscle. And here's one for like your calf muscle. In this case over here, you could create a very fast twitch, but you can't do another one, like it, it fatigues very fast. Whereas this one, you could stand on your tippy toes and you could stay up there for a longer amount of time See the difference? Okay? So some of them fatigue fast, some of them don't. Some of them move very fast, some of them move very slow. Pros and cons with each one of these. Quick thing about tone. You have isotonic and isometric. Isotonic is when a muscle contraction occurs and there's no change in the force of the contraction. For instance, if I'm taking this phone over here and we 
do away with the gravitational force. If I bring up this foam at the same rate all the way up, I'm only using it with the same force along this. The force I used here is the same force up here, which is the same force up here. Does that make sense? I'm not changing. If I go faster, that's changing the force. Or you put more weight on it, I'm changing the force. So it's just taking one weight and then bringing it up on a constant rate. This is what we call isotonic. The tone itself, iso means without change. Okay? We've seen isotonic when dealing with concentration. There's no change in concentration. Isotonic in this sense is that the tone does not change. It's equal. However, the distance between where the muscle is, like I, if I want to just move my forearm, we'll go back to that. If I just want to move my forearm, the distance between or the muscle that goes from my forearm to my shoulder, if I move it up like this with a constant rate, the tone is not going to change, but the distance between my of the muscle from this point to this point, they get closer together. Does that make sense? So in this case, isotonic, the tone does not change, but the distance of the two ends of the muscle does become shorter. Okay? So the distance, then the two ends that we didn't talk about yet was the origin insertion. The origin is up here, the insertion is over here. So the distance, the two points, is getting closer together. That's different than isometric. Isometric is where the distance between, between the two points of the muscle does not change. Iso meaning without change, metric like the metric system, distance does not change, but the tone does. And a good, ans a good example of this is me pushing against the wall. I'm trying to push against the wall so that my whole body goes through it. So my tone is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. But the distance between my, uh, the ends of my muscles is not moving unless I push the wall right through there. So does that make sense between isometric and isotonic? Okay? And it's just showing you here, putting a weight here. This is going to be isotonic. The weight goes over here. You're going to be changing the distance of the muscle, the muscle ends, but you're not going to change the tone of the muscle itself. It's still going to go up at a constant rate. Whereas over here, there's a bar here that's attached to us to the floor. You could be bringing that as high as you want, but you're not going to be able to pull that out of the ground. So you're putting more and more tone to try and pull it out, but you're never going to do that. But the muscle itself is not changing the distance between its two points. Isotonic versus isometric. Okay? Then we have tone abnormalities, which is pretty easy to understand. Atonic, A means without. So this is without muscle tone. You could have hypotonic, where it's, it's, it's there, but it's, it's not as strong. And then you could have someone with hypertonic, where it's very, um, uh, very intense. So we do this with babies. When a baby comes out, we want to check the reflexes. Now this is something we do, or pediatricians usually do, but don't have the mom look to see what we're doing. We're going to take the baby, as soon as the baby comes out, by the, uh, the little bassinet over there, we've got to check the baby's doing okay. We're going to take the baby like this, and we're going to drop the baby about an inch. It's nothing scary, but we're going to drop it like this. Hold the hand over here like this, and then drop the baby. The baby should do this. You know, however, it's a natural reflex to see how much tone is there. If we pick up the baby and it's like this, there's it's atonic, or there's like you know atonic, or there's hypotonic that's happening there. You see what I mean? Because that could tell us there's something going on, whether it wasn't much oxygen or there's something wrong with the nervous system. I don't know. But we do that, so it's not to scare you. We're not going to drop the baby, but we need to test to see if there's those reflexes. Okay. 
All right, muscle fibers. We have two different types of muscle fibers. Another thing that's pretty interesting about here, okay? We have slow twitch fibers, and these are called type one. And these are red fibers. These contain a whole lot of myoglobin, which makes sense why we would call it red muscles or red fibers. Because myoglobin gives the muscle the reddish color, the red brownish color. Myoglobin holds a lot of oxygen. There's not much glycogen in here of or being stored, but we have a lot of oxygen. So these muscles are adapted for aerobic metabolism because there's a lot of oxygen there. Okay? They're slow to contract, but they're slow to fatigue. We use these for postural muscles. All right? I mean, I can't really, I mean, I could bend my back like this and no problem, but it's not as fast as my eyeball movement. But my back, even though they don't move, the muscles in my back don't move that fast, they're very slow to fatigue. I could stand up here for 10 hours, and I can. I don't know if I want you, if you want to challenge me, we'll just keep on talking. No. All right? Um, but we could also use this for endurance exercise five or ten mile marathons, swimming three miles, because they can withstand, you know, a lot of oxygen that's in there, okay? So those are fibers, that's uh, slow twitch fibers, type one, or the red fibers. Then we also have fast twitch fibers, or type two fibers, and these are white fibers, okay? These can have less myoglobin, but there's a lot of uh, glucose in there stored in glycogen. These are adapted for anaerobic metabolism because there isn't much oxygen stored there. These are fatigued very rapidly though. Okay? These are more for your extraocular eye muscles. Again, you make your eyeballs go back and forth, back and forth. They move very fast but they also fatigue very fast. Same thing with your biceps. There's so much, you know, you're gonna get tired with that. So these are for exercises for explosive large movements. The sprinters, right? Lifting up a heavy box kind of thing. Okay, does that make sense? My sprinters would use this. So, most skeletal muscles are a mixture of both types of fibers. Now this is where it gets interesting, because proportion of these fibers vary genetically, making maybe if you have, I mean, make it, if some people have more type one fibers in certain muscles, and certain other people have more type two in those same muscles, but in their bodies. So it'll make it really interesting to measure percentages of fiber types in athletes. Maybe you were born with more muscle, you know, like say you have more, uh, maybe you're born as a sprinter and that's the reason why. You have more white fibers in your leg muscles. That's why you can do this. So it would be very interesting because you can't change that. But if you found out that you have a lot of red fibers and you want to be a sprinter, is that something, you know, I mean, yeah, go ahead and try and do that. But you may have more difficulty becoming a sprinter than some other people because they have this. Does that make sense? Not that you can't do it. I want to discourage you from doing it. I think you, you can do it. You just need to put more time and effort into something like that. So that kind of makes sense about chickens. Okay? Chickens have white breast meat and dark leg meat. Does that make sense? They have breast meat over here, which controls their wings. Here, high in myoglobin and their feet. Can chickens fly very well? No. Their muscles, they go right? Because their muscles and their breast muscles are, very, they fatigue very fast. So that's why there's, the breast meat is the white milk, or the white meat, right? But go ahead and ask Rocky to go and try and catch one of those, those chickens. They are fast on their feet. 
because they have to brown meat in there. Does that make sense? All right. Now, if that's so, then what about the duck? Because they have dark breast meat. Does it make sense why? All right. So next time you go and you love your the breast meat, all right, you, which means you like the, the white meat because you're used to fried chicken, you go and order for duck, ask for the legs of the duck because that's where the white meat is. Does that make sense? See, everything I talk about in my lectures has something to do with food. Okay? Um, let me finish up this. Probably take about like 10, 10 more minutes and then I'll give you guys a break. Okay, because this is, um, it's just talking about smooth muscle um, and uh, cardiac muscle contraction. If you understand what we talked about with muscle contraction and all of this and the sarcomeres and stuff, now I'm just going to show you uh, what the smooth muscle dip with the contraction, and how is that different from that? So that basically shows you skeletal muscle, how the contraction happens. So how is it? Why is it smooth muscle doesn't have those striations? That's what I want to show you here. So smooth muscle anatomy, myosin and actin are there, okay? The cross bridging uh, formation does occur, but the thick and thin filaments don't have those repeating kind of stripes that you see though, okay? There's no Z discs. It's different, it's arranged differently. Instead, the thin filaments are attached to protein structures called dense bodies. And this attaches to the sarcolemma. Now, other things about the smooth muscle is that there are no sarcomeres. There's no Z discs. They're scanty. Very few sarcoplasmic reticulums that are scattered in the area. So there's a problem. Because in skeletal muscle, we need the sarcoplasmic reticulum because it's loaded with calcium. Well, how is calcium because we still need it for contraction over here. So where's the calcium coming from if it's not from the sarcoplasmic reticulum? There's no T tubules there either. So let, before, let me just show you what it looks like. This is how it's arranged in smooth muscle. Remember, they're shaped like a fusiform shape or football shape, and they're shaped like this. This is relaxed, and this is how they're contracted. And the dense bodies is where they crisscross. These are the uh, my, um, actin and my, myofin, uh, actin and myosin filaments that are over here. Okay, so that's how it's arranged. That's why we don't see those stripes in the smooth muscle. So the contraction of smooth muscle, basically, I'm only going to show you the differences. When you, if you know the skeletal muscle contraction, use that as your template, and then these are what's different about it. Okay, contractions are initiated by calcium from the interstitial fluid coming from outside the cell. Remember, interstitial fluid is, is tissue or uh, fluid tissue that's in between the cells, not in the cell. So in essence, it's outside the cell, extracellular fluid. So the depolarization is when calcium comes into the cell. It's not because of sodium. It's due to calcium coming in. That's what's one, that's a major difference over here, okay? Calcium then is gonna bind to a protein inside the smooth muscle cell called comodulin. The comodulin, so calcium is not gonna bind to actin. Calcium is going to bind to calmodulin, which is this protein. Then this calmodulin calcium complex activates an enzyme called myosin kinase. And this will actually cause the actin and myosin to contract. So it's a little bit different. I tried looking for a good picture. There are pictures out there. I just was not too happy with the pictures I'm seeing. One of these days I'll come up with my own drawing as I'm doing a lot of art therapy. I think I can come up with something, but I haven't found uh, one yet. But that's where uh, the contraction occurs, okay? And calcium leaves the smooth muscle very slowly. And this is a key thing, because if you think about where smooth muscle is, it's around blood vessels, it's around uh, the intestines. So if it's around the blood vessels and calcium leaves very slowly, there's gonna be kind of a sustained contraction. It's gonna be able to maintain blood pressure for a longer amount of time. 
It's gonna, if it's around your intestines, it's gonna be able to squeeze the food for a longer amount of time. It's not gonna be something quick like that. All right, you want it. Think of it, again, physiology reflects anatomy. Function reflects structure. It makes sense where this is and why it's doing that, okay? So calcium stays in the cell longer, making the contractions last longer than the skeletal muscle. We call that a state of continued partial contraction to maintain blood pressure, okay? So examples of, like I said, the significance of this longer contraction, get the steady pressure to maintain the, the contents in the GI tract, right, the gastrointestinal tract, and able to create this steady blood pressure when we deal with the blood vessels so it stays around there, okay? It's a good place for this to happen, all right? It's also autorhythmic, meaning that uh, they contract rhythmically and independently. Meaning like, if this one contracts, the next one's gonna contract and so forth. It kind of gives you this milking contraction from the beginning to the end. And that's what goes on with this. So that's smooth muscle contraction. Now cardiac muscle contraction, I'm gonna show you the differences when compared to skeletal muscle. All right? They have our wonderful intercalated discs. Intercalated discs are special gap junctions or communicating junctions that permit ions to carry electrical signals directly into the cell from cell to cell. And it happens at a much faster rate. And you'll learn about these a little bit more when you get A and P2 with cardiology. But the intercalated disc, the way it's arranged, allows for this action potential in these ions to go from one cell to the other much more rapidly than it was before in the other cells. And they look like these sliced oranges and allowing them to come in, okay? Why is it branched? Because if an action potential comes from this cardiac muscle and it goes to this one, it could now go to two or three cardiac muscles all at the same time. The branching makes it go by really fast, the contraction from one cell to the other. The spread of the ash potential is astronomical in the cardiac muscle. And you would expect it to be there when you're dealing with a heart that's going to pump blood and get the oxygen and glucose from one cell or from one site to another. Okay? So cardiac muscle contraction, similar to skeletal muscle, but I'm going to show you the differences as I just showed you in smooth muscle. The sarcoplasmic reticulum in cardiac muscle is there but it's very poorly developed, okay? However, the T-tubules are larger and they bring in more calcium from the outside of the cell. So the calcium too is coming from extracellular, much like the smooth muscle. The contraction is the same with skeletal muscle, meaning the myosin uh, binds to the actin as the calcium binds to the troponin and so forth. The kind of thing I showed you with the sleeve very similar to that. The contraction, however, can occur without neural stimulation. You don't need to have that neuromuscular junction there. So you could actually, you probably all think this right now, you could rip out my heart. Okay, yeah, you're all laughing, but you're holding it in, right? right. You rip out my heart, and if you can make the heart not die and put it in saline, so there's oxygen in there and there's um, glucose, it will beat by itself. You don't need to have electricity going to it from the nervous system. Okay? It has its own, what we call pacemaker. It has its own battery in there. And it can actually do that. Now you need to have the nervous system hooked up to it because the heart will only beat by itself 70, 80 beats per minute. That's it. But there's times you want it to go faster and there's times you want it to go slower. So you gotta have it hooked up to the nervous system because the nervous system can make it go faster or slower. But it will beat by itself at a constant rate of 70, 80 beats per minute if you're making it survive in saline and you're giving it nutrients and, and oxygen, okay? So that's, and you'll learn more, much more about that when you get into cardiology. It's also autorhythmic, just the way smooth muscle is, kind of milking uh, the contractions going on. Uh, like I said, the nervous system has to be hooked up to the heart, uh, and it's a spe special type of nervous system called the autonomic nervous system, meaning that the nervous system is going to make the heart beat automatically. 
but it's going to make it beat faster or slower. That's what this autonomic nervous system is going to do. It's going to make the heart rate, HR's heart rate, to go faster or slower. But it will beat by itself. It doesn't mean to have the nervous system. Okay? There's no quick twi twitches. You wouldn't expect that. You want nice, slow twitches to push that blood out. You don't want something that's going to go and then you're not going to have all the blood pushed out to, um, um, to be, you know, good cardiac output to go out there. And apparently, it actually uses aerobic metabolism almost exclusively. So there is a lot of myoglobin in the heart muscle. That makes the heart what color? Red. And I think that's where the connection is that hearts are red. Okay? Uh, there's a lot of myoglobin in there. Okay? And we have a large amount of uh, mitochondria in there also. This is going to make a lot of ATP. Okay? Um, abnormal findings, uh, I guess, let me do this really quickly for you, it's, it's not too bad. Atrophy, muscle wasting, you can see here, muscle's very thin, here it's very thick. Um, this is where we have a decrease in muscle cell size and muscle cell number, as we talked about with histology. And it's usually due to malnutrition or just not using the muscle as much. That's why when we have people in comas, we need to still exercise those muscles so they don't, they don't atrophy, okay? Um, avulsion is where the muscle tears away from the tendon, or the tendon tears away from the bone. We call it an avulsion. Uh, myalgia is a fancy word for muscle pain. Okay. Um, paralysis is loss of voluntary movement. Muscle spasm or muscle cramp is involuntary depolarization to tetanus, so that becomes in that way, and it's usually due to overexercise. Um, so now you can go and tell your folks that, you know, you didn't have a muscle cramp, you had an involuntary contraction of the skeletal muscle. And they're like, ooh, wow, you, whatever you're learning over there, just continue going with Dr. Marlon, he's teaching a lot of stuff. All right, so you have all these new words you could actually say. Um, fibrillation is an unorganized uh, amount of contractions that prevents smooth, uh, smooth, easy contraction. It kind of quivers. Ventricular, when we deal with the heart, ventricular fibrillation, or V-fib. You've probably heard that in the TV shows and stuff. That's just the heart is quivering, so there's not enough blood that's going to be coming out, and that's not going to sustain life, all right? So that's, that's a good example of that. Convulsions is a group of muscles that get stimulated involuntarily and causes tympanic contractions to occur. And we usually see that with epilepsy, all right? We'll talk epilepsy when we get to the nervous system. Contracture. All right, inactivity of paralysis and paralysis, plus it also deals with continuing nerve impulses. It's a phenomenon we're not really sh too sure how this all occurs, but you got paralysis there, but the nerve pulses are still going to it. So now you got a contraction like this, like a spastic, spastic paralysis kind of thing. All right, you can't move it; it's contract, it's contracted, but there's more. There's a nerve, um, nerve impulses that are still going over it. That's why it's so contracted like that. All right. It becomes progressively flexed like that, where it stays in that position, and it's usually immovable. Um, treatment is usually some kind of muscle relaxant or range of motion exercise, just get that range of motion. There's a specific kind of contraction called the Voigtring's contraction, which is an, uh, kind of an interesting one. They have a flex, uh, flex fingers, usually the third and or, uh, fourth and fifth digits, have a contraction that usually occurs right down in here in the tendon. Okay, usually it's due to alcoholism. Okay, well I don't understand the mechanism why that would happen, but they have this flexure, this contraction that actually happens right over here. And uh, liver disease is also another good example of this. But again, you know, alcoholism, cirrhosis of the liver, I mean they still go hand in hand, um, hepatitis too. Or some people could just have it idiopathic wise. In other words, we don't know what, what causes it. But mostly it's alcoholics. All right, and usually it doesn't affect them. If they could still pick up things and drive and stuff, they're fine with that. But when it starts, you know, if they're supposed to be type, you know, they, it starts developing and they were a pianist or something like that or a typist, then we'll have to do some surgery to fix that. And um, that's where it appears over here. You see it? So don't worry, I looked at everyone's hand, you're all fine, all right? I don't know what you that's what I mean. You know, when someone hands me money as a cashier and they're handing me money, I can't help but look at their hands. 
They're handing me money. I see their hand there. I see the portraits contracture. I'm not going to say, oh, I know what you do. <laughs> but I have, you know, most, because it's not, I can't speculate, because most cases it's because of alcoholism, not all cases. So I don't want you to, you know, to diagnose someone, oh, I know what you do, but there's a good sign that there's probably some alcoholism in, in, their, in their system, uh, or was in their system. I don't want you to say they're an alcoholic now, because I can get in trouble with that. But you know what I'm saying? Like, there's, it's usually because of alcoholism that causes that. Uh, a sprain, you've heard of this. A sprain is overstretching a ligament. Then we have a strain. A strain is an overstretching of tendon. So my little mnemonic is strain, T, and T for tendon. Or it could be a muscle that's being pulled. There isn't much of a, um, a mnemonic there, even though I put a P there and L. I mean, it's not much. But if you know that tendon strain, then ligament must be the other one. Right? It's that process of elimination. This can lead to avulsion if you had it too, you know, if you stretch it too much. Okay? It consists of bruising and capillaries, pain, and inflammation. Now, a medical treatment is, or a, a, a non-medical treatment, a non-surgical treatment that you could do is something called rice. Who here has heard of rice? About half the class. Okay. Rice is just something you could just do if you don't want to see the doctor and you know, you think that you're spraying something, try this for a few days. Rest, rest it. Don't walk on it. Ice, put ice on it. Ice is a great anti-inflammatory mechanism. The ice will just keep the swelling down. Great mechanism. See, most students forget about, I don't know, what they put a lot of different things. Chips is on there too, I don't know what that is. But compression, that's where the ACE band is. You want to compress that area to keep the swelling down. And then E, elevate it. Okay, keep it so that the fluid can go towards your heart, so your heart can pump it out and maybe to pee it out, kind of thing. So that's what we usually do is this rice thing. It's a non-surgical, non-medicinal thing, meaning like you're not going to put anything in your mouth with this, um, and see if it works. If there's no relief after a few days, go see the doctor. There's probably something else going on. Okay. Questions about that? Okay. All right, disease of accessory structures, you probably could figure this out, bursitis, fasciitis, there's also plantar fasciitis, and this occurs in the bottom of the feet due to exercising too much, okay? Uh, you get tail pain with that. Uh, tendonitis, you can figure out that part. Shin splints is also something else that we usually see with excessive uh, people running a lot, and they get the pains right by their shins, okay? And it's inflammation of the tendons on the flexor muscles that are over there very painful and it's due to uh, run, you know, get good shoes and run not on uh, rocks, run on something that's rubbery, you know, like a track or whatever. Okay? Sound good?